Right, hello everyone. Um, I'm making this video today for writing your report on the EPQ. We're now at the stage where you should have planned the report and you've got an idea of the global structure of the report. And you're going to want to start writing, but I really want to emphasize before you write the introduction, before you're able to set up the argument, you really do have to plan the whole of the EPQ. So make sure that you've done that first. So what are we going to cover today? Well, first of all, I want to think, I want to get you thinking about the structure and the writing of your final report or essay. I want to help you with the planning of your work. I want to help you uh, refine your understanding of the function of introductions. I'm going to look at some examples of well-written introductions. And then we're going to examine an example and we're going to evaluate it, okay? So I think today's uh, session will be very, very good if you are struggling with how to begin the writing and you don't really have a really good knowledge of what the function of an introduction is. First thing I'm going to say, I want to give a lot of credit to um, this particular textbook here, the EPQ Toolkit for AQA. Uh, all of you should have a copy of this. If you haven't, please email me and I can give you an electronic copy. It's an excellent textbook in terms of offering advice on writing. And the relevant pages are pages 74 to 92. So please have a look at this um, textbook. As I say, uh, for a lot of today's uh, content, I've taken that, so I'd like to thank the authors for that. So, looking at a slide from Manchester University, uh, Manchester University is one of the best universities for providing uh, resources on the EPQ. They talk about the structure of the report as being um, introduction, a literature review, methodology, findings and discussions, conclusion and the abstract last. Usually, and I'll talk a little bit about the abstract today, but I'll do a separate video on this. The abstract is the overview of your argument. Usually that would come before the introduction. It's a very short piece of writing, at most, say, 200 words. Um, that's not something I want to uh, uh, talk about too much today. In terms of things like the methodology, that very much depends on what kind of essay you are writing, what kind of report you're writing. And um, the literature review, once again, it will depend on the subject matter, whether you've had to read a great deal or not. So moving on to the actual idea of the introduction. What is the introduction for? Why do we write them? Well, first of all, it's an overview of the argument you're presenting. I must stress once again, all EPQ reports must have a sense of discussion or an argument if they are reports. If you're doing an artifact, then this video doesn't really apply to you, and I will do a separate one for artifact report writing because it's a different genre. So in terms of this overview of the argument, um, you're basically presenting, as I say here, a statement of what is to come. If we think of an introduction like introducing a person, you're going to tell people something about them so that they can start a conversation. Well, in an essay, this, the, uh, the introduction partly defines what it is that you are writing for. What's the purpose of the writing? What is it you hope to achieve? Like the abstract, the introduction can only be written once you've completed the literature review and you've decided what your findings are. Must emphasize that again. Do not start writing, and I've been a teacher for many years, and I've watched students do this, do not start writing unless you know what it is that you're going to conclude. You cannot write an introduction unless you have an idea of what your findings are going to be. So you must have planned the whole essay first. And in the introduction, you're going to briefly signpost your argument. So you might say something along the lines of, I'm going to look at whether... Um, uh, criminals are caused by genes or whether they're uh, caused by uh, elements of society. In order to do this, I'm going to look at the work of da da da, and you might say a few theorists. And then you might give an indication of uh, what you're going to conclude, yeah? Um, and that's just one example of a particular way that you might write an introduction. So, as I say here, the challenge is to be brief and to stay completely focused. Further detail like going into details and naming people and going into details about studies, etc., shouldn't occur in the introduction because the introduction must be concise. Further detail is reserved for the main body, for the discussion aspect of the essay. 
So I say here, this slide I call creating a good first impression, and that's so important in life in general, isn't it? Introduction will be the first thing someone reads. It will be basically decide whether they want to read it or not, okay? So as I say here, it's a starting point and a definition of the topic with a statement of objectives. So you must establish a purpose for writing in the introduction. You're going to also give a brief outline, the key word here is brief, of what is to be covered. And this might be the signposting, okay? First, this essay will look at this. This report will do this. Then I will go on to do this, etc. Okay. So give the reader a sense of the direction of the report. This helps orientate them around the report. You might also want to establish the research territory, showing the general research area and why you're interested in it or why it's problematic. Okay. So you might say something along the lines of, this report is going to look at whether criminals are genetic or whether they're socially created. And this is so important because it has incredible uh, implications for the justice system and whether we hold people accountable for crimes. And if so, it's going to uh, affect the way that we sentence people, etc. And uh, this essay will address this gap in knowledge. This is not something that's been written about enough or you're going to establish why it is that you feel that your essay might be establishing new territory. Now, I can't emphasize enough the importance of the research question, which is why in Project Q, in the production log, we spend so much time looking at the candidate proposal and refining your research question over and over again. Now, in my own research, these are two questions which I've been playing with recently. The first is, to what extent does project-based learning extend the agency of learners in an international school in the Middle East? So here I'm looking at the idea of uh, PBL, project-based learning, things like the EPQ. And the idea of agency is choice making, the freedom to make choices. So uh, in my own research, I might be looking at how the EPQ, unlike the rest of the curriculum, gives you this ability to choose a driving question, to refine the question yourself, to uh, decide autonomously how you're going to address this question and to look at some of the research, okay? So in my introduction, I would have this research question as absolutely central. Another question I've looked at is, how might the EPQ foster self-regulated learning? So uh, a similar question in this case, the emphasis, however, being on self-regulation, on the idea that the learner has the ability to make decisions. So it has a great deal of in common with uh, the idea of agency. But self-regulation would be, for instance, not being chased up for work, etc. So once again, if I were to be writing an introduction on this particular research paper, I would have this particular research question as central to my introduction. So that's an important thing for you to remember. You might actually want to write your research question into your introduction if you wanted to, um, to emphasize it a great deal. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about a particular paper uh, that I think it would be of great interest to you. It's called Forced Migrants. Burden or Benefit to Greece. This is a paper that was written by a desk student uh, a number of years ago. I think it's a particularly excellent introduction. And I'm going to be emphasizing a number of aspects of the introduction of the report. First of all, we're going to look at how it has a definition of migrants. I'm going to look at how it builds the context. It helps the reader to give the reader some of the information they need in order to access this debate. It looks at why there's a reason for the debate, you know, why are people having this debate? Why are they arguing? It looks at the nature of the debate. Some people are saying this, opponents of uh, migration are saying this, okay? Sympathizers of migrants are saying this. And I cannot uh, emphasize enough how important it is that in the introduction you set up the debate. You make sure that you show that there are competing views. We do not want essays that are descriptive, that just give information. We want essays that have some kind of discussion, some kind of a tussle of views. And in this particular introduction, she also sets forth her thesis. So 
I'm looking at them now. I've called this section context building. The 21st century has witnessed the displacement and movement of significant numbers of people within and from the developing world due to reasons including climate change, development projects such as the Metro Manila Railway Project, political upheaval and war. By the end of 2016, that's when she was writing, over 65 million people have been forced to leave their countries. This is 300,000 more than in 2015 and greater than the entirety of the UK's population. It equates to approximately one person in every hundred. The refugee crisis continues and the statistics are dire. 180 people have been displaced from their homes every minute, which amounts to three individuals per, per second. This is the highest influx of refugee migration in the history of the world, outperforming mass migrations such as India and uh, the India partition, as well as the Great Migration. Now, I think that this is a superb opening. It gives us contextual information, as I say. It does the context building, but it also creates a tremendous sense of drama. And I'm not usually a fan of lots of numbers, but here the numbers are really interesting and they have genuine impact on the reader and they show why this research matters so much. When she says that uh, uh, three individuals per second are being displaced from their homes, it makes the image incredibly concrete. It gives us something to understand why there's such an urgency for this writing. Now I said uh, the research question or the purpose I'm looking at, same essay, let's look at a different section of the introduction. As countries across the world, particularly in Europe and the Middle East, absorb large numbers of refugee populations, the social, economic and political impact of this mass population movement on host countries becomes particularly pertinent. This paper will explore the extent to which refugee uh, populations are a burden or a benefit to host communities, particularly in terms of how they impact social and economic services within different countries. While refugee populations have certainly exerted pressure on the resources of host countries, they have also stimulated valuable transformation within the societies. So I'm going to pause for one moment and tell you why I like that so much, okay? First of all, it clearly establishes the purpose. It's looking at whether refugees are a burden or a benefit. So that re uh, research question is central to the introduction and it defines the task and it tells the reader what the discussion is going to be. And here, briefly, concisely and incredibly lucidly, it tells you why there's a debate. That some people say it's overstretching the services and other people will be saying, actually, it brings about valuable transformation. Using the case study of Greece, this paper will study how the healthcare system, usually portrayed as having suffered from the influx of refugees, has in fact witnessed the beginning of positive change since the refugee crisis became. So here it defines the parameters. It's going to look at Greece as a case study for this research question. And it also gives you a brief thesis that the thesis of this particular essay, this particular report, will be that the influx of refugees has had a number of positive changes, okay? So we know why she's written, we know the direction of the research, excellent ingredients of an introduction. Now, signposting the structure of the report, as I say here. The first section of the paper provides an overview of the already existing academic literature on refugees and their impact on host countries. So she's chosen to do a separate literature review. Now, this is one form, there's one structure that's permissible. But if you watch my other video, I've also talked about the fact that the literature review can be woven throughout the essay. It doesn't need to be a separate or discrete section. This research devotes significant attention to whether refugees are a burden or benefit to the host country. And she mentions a couple of scholars there whose names I don't dare try and pronounce. And she says they highlight the social and economic impacts which refugees have had on these countries and in turn how this has impacted refugee populations. This research will be evaluated from two different perspectives, one being economically and the other socially. The second half of the paper provides a case study analysis of Greece. So this is actually excellent, isn't it? Because it defines the methods that will be used. In this case, she's going to use two different lenses. Firstly, an economic lens, 
and secondly, a social lens, so more of a socio-cultural approach. And she actually tells you about the structure of the report, because she says in the second half of it, this will be the actual case study when she looks at Greece in particular. I'm a huge advocate for the case study method because it allows you to look at a big question like eating disorders or look at something like uh, migration as we're seeing here. And if we use the case study approach, it then allows you to narrow down and do a digestible and actually feasible amount of research by confining your paper to this particular case. And now I'm going to take one uh, that was taken from the textbook. Um, this is on page 81 of the EPQ toolkit for AQA. And I'm going to read this particular one. The title is, How Feasible is the Prospect of Establishing Places of Permanent Habitation on Mars? It's a very interesting topic, quite dangerous in some sense because it's so hypothetical. But I feel that this is a well-written introduction. This project will investigate whether we are, reach, we are in reach of establishing a base on Mars in which people could live permanently. This would be useful for humanity as any number of apocalypse disasters could destroy a civilization in its current state. Having a backdrop could preserve the knowledge we've amassed over millennia. Single planet species don't survive. Just look at the dinosaurs, says former astronaut John Grunsfield. Very interesting and dramatic opening. I will review the research to date, which has focused on various obstacles to establishing a base on Mars, such as radiation and microgravity. Technology is currently being developed in order to minimize the risk to potential astronauts during their journey to Mars. The radiation the ast astronauts will be exposed to varies throughout the solar cycle, so good timing of a mission will be paramount. With this in mind, the radiation exposure level could be within safe levels. Muscle and bone atrophy also stand to be major health problems. The fitness regime that the astronauts will have to maintain is laborious and time consuming to keep muscle and bone density at levels similar to those initially. On Mars, the gravity is less than on Earth, so atrophy will affect the astronauts on arrival. However, their bone and muscle density will maintain itself at a level at which strength is comparable to that on Earth. So preventative measures seem to be taken only if a return journey is planned. When on Mars, a base will have to be established which will be able to support the colonists' needs. As most of these needs essentially are energy and infrastructure concerns, a solution is sending multiple spacecraft carrying nuclear generators and the infrastructure needed. This would be incredibly difficult as mission success rates to Mars are relatively low. So a solution will need to be established to ensure the uh, colonists receive the equipment they need. It will take years of effort and work to get even close to a point where its implementation could be considered. However, there's currently a lot of work being done to study the intricacies and hopefully all the challenges posed can be overcome as technology develops. Well, it's a very interesting introduction. As I said, it's a dangerous topic in the sense that it's so hypothetical. And uh, the research at the moment is obviously not empirical research. A lot of it is speculative. However, it does set up a really interesting discussion. And you can feel the structure of the report after this, can't you? You can see the different sections. That the first thing is that you will have to look at this solar cycle over here you will have to look at this muscle and bone atrophy again after that. And then you'll have to look at infrastructure needs. So I feel as though this introduction has signposted three very clear sections of the report that are likely to follow. Now, according to the textbook, this overview has established a research territory in the first paragraph by showing how important the topic is. The quotation is also thought provoking. In the second paragraph, there's a brief mention of background research that will be further discussed in the literature review. That's a key point, isn't it? That you want to touch upon your research and clearly indicate to the reader that later on in the report, far more detail will follow. In the third paragraph, relevant themes and issues are identified. And in the final paragraph, there is a mention of differing points of view. 
and I can't again emphasize this aspect enough. EPQs which do not have a discussion, an argument, a clash of views, a thesis and a counter thesis will never score highly because the high marks will come from the critical evaluation of sources and points of view. So it's not enough to give views and explain what people have said a good EPQ will evaluate, judge those views, look to measure them and look to say which point of view is stronger. Now, I'm not going to read this one out, but this is an interesting one as an exercise for you to do. This is an EPQ with a very interesting title, Boys Will Be Boys, a critical discussion of whether lads, magazines are sexist, a harmful or harmless fun. And it gives you a really interesting exercise. It says, can you find out where the starting point is, a brief outline, the research territory, a niche, a background, a statement of the scope of the work? So I think that that would be quite an interesting exercise for you to go ahead and do. OK, I'm not going to go through the answers because I think that that's something you could do on your own. I'm now going to move on to one of my favorite EPQs. Uh, the title for this EPQ was Graffiti and Social Control. To what extent does social order manipulate graffiti into street art? I should have put the pictures the other way. Here we have graffiti and here we have street art. Many of you will be familiar with the work of the great artist or artists, the plural Banksy. And um, it's an excuse for me to use some beautiful images in the rest of the presentation. So it's an interesting, really wonderful title. So we're looking at, you know, how social order turns graffiti into street art, makes it more acceptable, more aesthetically pleasing. OK, now, firstly, before I even look at the introduction, I just wanted to draw your attention to the contents page here. I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but this is a very, very well structured piece of writing. Each of the pieces of the jigsaw come together. And in this particular essay, he does a comparative study between London and between Dubai. Obviously, in Dubai, there have been different laws considering graffiti, etc. And I'm briefly going to look at his introduction now, and you can see how well signposted this is. And what a very fine piece of writing it is, too. Graffiti is depicted as the voice of the street, a palimpsest of anger, attitude and emotion. But now within modern age, one could argue that this voice is suppressed and mutated by the powers of government and corporations. Furthermore, it is po possible to cover up the ugliness of graffiti societies, sanction and encourage the creation of street art which can be viewed as the beautification of the neoliberal hatred of graffiti, overall resulting in a more sterilized notion of artistic creation. So very complex writing. I think you can see what he's arguing there is the idea in today's governments will want to control graffiti and beautify it into street art. Therefore, in order to contrast the various forms of graffiti and social control, this essay will explore two case studies, Dubai City Walk and London's Leak Street. So there he um, defines uh, the different cases that he's going to use very clearly, and he states how he is going to narrow down the topic. Interestingly, from conducting further investigation, the site which I already de uh, originally depicted as being raw and untouched by the authorities revealed itself to be one of the largest legal walls in the UK. Whilst helping to present the growing struggle of graffiti, the legal wall also demonstrates how commercialization has taken over the art form. This may present how, similar to uh, Dubai, governments use spaces such as legal walls and the global attraction to boost the area's income and popularity. So what he's looking at here is the idea that even in London, governments will want to control graffiti and to, you know, in a sense, make it into an attraction. Overall, perhaps the importance of graffiti derives not from its commercial use, but from its original intent of intersecting art and criminalization providing the population with a non-violent yet effective form of protest. So I think that I've chosen this introduction because it's so interesting. It does quite a lot of things. It defines that it's going to compare uh, London and New York, uh, sorry, London and Dubai. It uh, talks about what the function of graffiti is, and it looks very, very closely at this distinction between street art and graffiti. 
So we can see the argument is going to be about whether a particular form of art is graffiti or street art. I think it's very interesting and it gets us very involved in the particular project. And um, I put a beautiful little piece of, uh, of uh, as, you know, uh, street art here, of Banksy street art here. And I'm just going to conclude by saying that the introductions we've seen today don't only do things. They also entice and interest us, and they make us want to read about the report in general. So one of the key things in any introduction would be to try to entice and capture the reader's interest. So even when writing a scientific report, there is always the possibility of interesting the reader. There will be differences between different genres of reports. If you're writing a science report, if you're writing an English literature report, Obviously, they're going to be written in different styles. But in each case, interesting the reader, making them understand what it is you're going to argue, but also showing why your report will be interesting and why the findings matter. Now, I hope you found that uh, an interesting um, screencast. I will be doing a number more going through the main body of the essay, how to write a paragraph, and finally to look at conclusions. Thank you so much for listening.